Welcome everyone uh, to um, this uh, What Economists Really Do on the Economics of Mental Health. Um, I am Abby Adams Russell. I'm a professor in the economics department um, at Oxford, and I am completely delighted uh, to welcome Marta Golin. Uh, so Marta um, is a, a postdoc at the University of Zurich, uh, but she received um, her master's and PhD degrees um, from Oxford. Um, and Marta is one of uh, the leading economists um, of her generation, and a lot of her work features uh, the determinants um, and the kind of like understanding the kind of causes and consequences um, of poor um, mental health. Um, and so we're completely delighted um, to welcome her uh, for this talk. And um, I guess I just wanted to say a couple of words on like the fact that, you know, mental health and if you like the mental health crisis is clearly a kind of a pressing topic of discussion at the moment. There are kind of articles coming out every day um, in the media especially about the kind of collapse of mental health outcomes um, among young people in a number of countries. Um, and I just wanted to flag that in the department um, at Oxford, um, we've got a number of trained um, mental health first aiders, as well as access um, to kind of broader resources um, to kind of support students, staff um, and faculty. And so after this talk, as part of the follow up, I will be giving you a link to the recording of this talk and the recording of all the other talks um, in the series. And we'll also flag um, where all of those resources are for um, those with a university email address. So with that, um, I will hand over to Marta, actually, sorry, with one bit of housekeeping, uh, which is that as you have questions, please pop them in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, and I'll be um, kind of collecting all of those uh, for the Q&A at the end of the session. Um, so with that, <laughs> I will hand over to Marta. Um, yeah, super excited for your talk. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Abby, for inviting me. And uh, let me first try to um, uh, share my slides with you all. You should be seeing the presentation now. Um, so let me just start by thanking you all for uh, the invite, uh, for being, first of all, for the invite, and then to everyone um, for tuning in. When Abby asked me to give a talk about the economics of mental health, um, I got very excited about this because this is both a topic that, as Abby has said, um, it is really important right now. We have seen a dramatic increase in mental health conditions, especially among young people. So it is definitely something that, you know, um, as a person, but I think as a society, we should care about. But also um, mental health has been among my research interests and among the research interests of many fabulous economists out there. So today I really want to give you an overview of, first of all, why I think we should care about mental health, what economists can say about mental health, and some of the fantastic work um, that is out there on the topic. So um, before we start talking about mental health, let me just take the opportunity to kind of go over a few concepts and a few um, words that are used during my presentation, starting from the definition of mental health. So if we want to define mental health, um, we could go to the um, World Health Organization website and read the following definition. Mental health is a state of mental well-being that enables people to cope with the stresses of life, realize their abilities, learn and work well, and contribute to their community. So clearly from this definition, it emerges that mental health is so much more than the absence of a mental disorder. And that in fact, mental health is a fundamental part of our general health, and it has the potential to affect many aspects of our life. Now, typically when we talk about mental health, we tend to speak about, about it in a bit of a binary fashion. Either someone has good mental health or they do not. However, in reality, mental health exists on a complex continues, continuum, which is experienced differently from one person to the next, with varying degrees of difficulty and distress and potentially very different um, social and clinical manifestations of a certain underlying mental health conditions. So when do we say that someone has a mental, dis mental health disorder? Again, we can look at how the WHO defines mental disorders, and we would find that a mental disorder is characterized by a clinically significant disturbance in an individual's cognition, emotional regulation, 
or behavior, meaning that it is some condition that is usually associated with high degrees of distress or impairment in important areas of our life. Um, for example, our um, behavior with other people or our uh, productivity, for example. So having defined what mental health is and how we can classify mental disorders, the question that we can ask is why should we care about mental health in the first place? So the first and obvious reason is because many people around the world actually suffer from poor mental health. The prevalence of mental health conditions uh, globally has been estimated in 2019 to be around 12%. So 12% of the world population suffers from a mental health disorder. And if we look at which are the groups that are most at risk of suffering from these disorders, we would find that women have a higher prevalence of mental health conditions in their life and that young people are also particularly at risk. So if we look at children and adolescents, the latest data shows that around 20% of the world's children and adolescents have a mental health condition. And the most prevalent conditions worldwide are anxiety and um, depressive disorders. If the high prevalence of mental health conditions wasn't enough, we also know that mental disorders are a significant contributor to what we call the global burden of disease. What this means is that basically the burden of disease, um, as I'm representing it here in this graph, is the total number of years of good quality life that we lose globally because of different health conditions. As we can see in the graph, the biggest contributor to our lost years of good health are kind of the typical suspects that uh, we can all think about, like cardiovascular diseases, cancer, neonatal disorders. But the graph also shows that mental health disorders, among all other health disorders, come quite high up in the list of conditions that significantly reduce our quality of life and close to other conditions like diabetes or kidney diseases, which kind of would come to mind when we think about um, decreases in quality of life because of, of um, health conditions. The fact that mental health is an important component of our general health is also underscored by the fact that mental health has found significant space in the UN's global development goal. So first and foremost, there is um, one goal that aims to promote good mental health and that, well, that um, promotes good mental health and well-being and that directly mentions um, well-being as a target for what we should do to achieve global development. But mental health also features in, for example, the 10th goal of the UN Sustainable Development Goals um, that seeks to reduce inequalities, for example. And here, one of the aspects that is mentioned is um, reducing inequalities and discrimination towards people with mental health conditions. Or um, the 13th goal about climate action, where really the goal here is to strengthen the resilience um, to climate-related disasters. And one of the aspects that climate disasters um, also affect is um, mental well-being. Now, having discussed the general importance of mental health and sort of its key role in individual and global development, in the rest of the talk, I want to discuss why I think economists are very well placed to contribute to the discussion around the importance of mental health and also how we can promote mental well-being. And in doing so, I want to stress three main reasons why I think uh, we should be doing more research on uh, mental health um, from um, kind of the economist perspective. And the first reason is that mental health is really closely linked, linked to many of the economic outcomes that we have um, already been interested in. Um, so looking at mental health as one additional input or determinants of outcomes that we have been studied for a long we have been studying for a long time can be a way of expanding the scope of research questions that we are already well placed um, to answer. So just to give you some examples from uh, recent literature that I really like. Um, there is a recent study by Barbara Biasi and co-authors that makes use of administrative data from the whole population of Denmark to look at how um, poor mental health and specifically receiving a diagnosis for bipolar disorder, depression or schizophrenia affects our lifetime earnings. 
And the authors, um, to understand what the earning penalty is uh, that comes from a diagnosis of mental health condition, use an event study design, where they basically compare the evolution of earnings of individuals who at some point in their life receive a mental health diagnosis. And they compare the earnings profile of these people to the earning profiles of similar individuals that do not receive a diagnosis. So in this graph here, I'm showing you how um, the logarithm of earnings evolves um, for um, uh, people on average who have received a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, depression, and schizophrenia around the time of their diagnosis. And as we can see, individuals who um, are diagnosed with bipolar disorder, depression, or schizophrenia um, some, suffer a significant drop in their earnings around and immediately after their diagnosis. So for example, compared to the healthy population, people with a diagnosis of depression earn 36% um, uh, less, and people with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder um, earn 38% less. And actually, when we control for things that we may think may be confounding this effect, like family characteristics or individual characteristics that are both correlated with earnings and the probability of um, suffering from a mental health condition, the estimates change very little. So it really seems that mental health conditions comes with large earning penalties. In the same paper, the authors also exploit a change in the Danish regulation for access to drug treatments that meant that from one day to the next, essentially, people who suffered from bipolar disorders could, that, could get access to a new medication, lithium, which is a very effective treatment for bipolar disorders compared to other pharmaceutical interventions that were available before, um, before the time when lithium was introduced. And the authors then compared the earning penalties that I'm showing you here of people with a diagnosis of the bipolar disorders, and they compared the penalties for people who did not and did get access to lithium as a maintenance treatment for BD around the time when uh, bipolar disorders usually arise. And in doing so, they found that having access to this very effective form of treatment for bipolar disorder reduces the earning penalty by between a third and two thirds, depending on the specifications that they run. This means that promoting good mental health through effective treatments actually helps mitigate quite a lot of the negative consequences that men mental health conditions may have for our um, labor market outcomes, for example. But not only that, mental health doesn't only matter for our earnings, it also matters for things like uh, economic decision making. Another study that I think is really great um, looks at the long term effects of a randomized control trial that provided psychotherapy to a group of prenatally depressed mothers in Pakistan. And this was one of the largest psychotherapy trials at the time when it was run in the world that investigated the impact of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for treating depression. The intervention was, first of all, effective in the short term in reducing depressive symptoms. But what the authors do in this paper is they go back to the study site seven years after the intervention was run to look at how um, trial participants uh, have been doing, not only in terms of their depression, but also in terms of other um, types of outcomes that we may be interested in, like, for example, um, financial empowerment or the way in which they uh, made investments in their children. And what they find is that when they return to the study site seven years after the trial, the authors found that the intervention had significant and persistent effect on, on depression. So a one-off intervention around the, um, the time of childbirth was effective in reducing depression also in the long term. But also um, the authors found that this intervention kind of put treated women on a different path that generated future improvements in other outcomes of interest. For example, in the middle part of the graph here, we can see that the women who underwent psychotherapy as part of the intervention scored significantly higher on an indicator of financial empowerment 
They were more likely to have control of household spending, and they also made more investments in their children, both in terms of the time that they spent with them engaging in active um, and, and, and productive activities, but also in terms of the money that went into um, child-related goods. Um, there's a lot more that economists have studied in terms of the consequences of mental health, just to cite a few things. Um, mental health has been found to lead to worse labor market outcomes in terms of higher rates of absenteeism, lower productivity, um, lower probability of remaining in employment, but also higher likelihood of engaging in risky and potentially criminal behaviors. And when it comes to children, um, uh, mental, poor mental health, and in particular ADHD, has also been found to um, affect the way in which children accumulate human capital and then perform um, in school. Now, at this point, I hope I have convinced you that mental health is an important determinant of many of the socioeconomic outcomes that we care about, which is partly why research on mental health is rapidly growing in economics. But another reason why I think economists should talk more about mental health is that as economists, most of the work that we do revolves around kind of trying to understand whether one variable, one factor, one input is causally related to an outcome that we're interested in. And I think this very quantitative approach that we adopt and the focus on causal inference can be useful also to provide research evidence on discussions about what determines mental health. And here, I want to use a very recent example of a debate that has started about the link between new technological advancements like the diffusion of broadband internet and the development of social media and their link to mental health. This question has received and still receives a lot of attention in the popular press. Here I'm showing you, for example, uh, some of the newspaper articles that have been dealing with this topic. But the political circles have also um, started to talk about the link between mental health, internet and social media, and have raised concerns about the potentially detrimental effects that online activities have um, on the, the mental health of youth and adolescents. And just to give you an example, um, the, the US Senate has, heard, has held a committee hearing in late 2021, where they explicitly discussed the link between Facebook, Instagram, and social media use and mental health. And only a few days ago, um, Vivek Murthy, who is the Surgeon General of the United States, named, meaning that he's the leading spokesperson on matters of public health, said that we are in the middle of a national mental health crisis and that youths are at risk of severe negative impacts on their development. And he pointed at the role in social me of social media in potentially contributing to this mental health crisis. So why has this debate uh, about internet, social media use and mental health emerged? Essentially, it all started around 2012 um, with the observation that around that time when access to broadband internet had become widespread, social media had been invented and it started to gain popularity, in that same period, we observed a very marked increase in symptoms of poor mental health among the adolescents. This is true for the UK and the US, as shown from this graph that comes from a recent Financial Times article, um, but also in other countries. And here, for example, in the graph, we can see that around 2012, or between 2010 and 2020, we've seen a rapid increase in both um, an index of combined depressive, depressive symptoms, but also in um, the share of adolescents that um, feels like they are a failure or that has negative feelings about life. So academic researchers have also become interested in this question with pioneering work on this topic being led by psychologist Jean Twenge. And the first academic studies that tried to investigate whether there was a link between mental health and social media use or internet use relied mostly on cross-sectional data. And they found that correlationally, People who spent more time on the internet or on their smartphones and had um, higher social media use also had a higher likelihood of reporting symptoms of depression or anxiety. But what are the mechanisms that were hypothesized to lead to a reduction in mental health? 
Well, researchers argued that online activities essentially are replacing other in-person or off offline um, activities that we know are kind of good for our mental health. Um, for example, digital socializing um, has been found to displace in-person gatherings, and um, it, it has also been found to displace other leisure time activities, like, for example, doing sports um, or hanging out with family that we know are kind of good for our not only health, but in general, not only mental health, but in general for our well-being. And it was also argued that the diffusion of social media meant that social media users portray a very limited part of their life that is usually the part of, their, of one's life that is most exciting or fulfilling. And this means that other users, when looking at kind of each other's profile, were suddenly exposed to impossible models of reality, and they were then more likely to engage in unfavorable comparisons, meaning they were more likely to compare themselves to these unrealistic and um, unfavorable models. But at least at the beginning, most of the studies um, that tried to link um, internet and social media use um, to mental health were correlational in nature, meaning that it wasn't, it wasn't clear whether internet and social media use was really causing a deterioration in mental health. So then the question that we should really ask is, are internet use, smartphones and social media really to blame for the recent rise in mental health disorders? And this is something that um, economists have been growing more and more interested in in recent years. Now, identifying these causal relationships between internet, social media use and mental health is very hard. First of all, because, um, well, there is a fundamental lack of data on good measures of mental health um, that has only kind of recently um, uh, been, been relaxed with the use of new um, survey measures of mental health that overcome some of the problems related to people um, not feeling comfortable reporting whether they have, um, some, they have had a diagnosis of a mental health condition, for example. But also there are two fundamental problems that, allow, that do not allow us to identify causal effects um, of internet and social media use of mental health at, that easily. One is what in economics we call omitted variable bias, um, which, is essentially, which essentially means that there are some unobserved characteristics, behaviors, or factors that, as I said, we do not observe, but that cause at the same time higher social media use and worse mental health. So when we go into data and we look at the correlation between internet use, social media use and mental health, we find that there is a negative correlation. We may be tempted to attribute the negative correlation to a negative effect that the internet has on mental health, when in fact, we may be misattributing the effect of something else that we do not observe to the effect that the internet has. And also, when we observe this negative correlation between internet use, social media use, and mental health, we run the risk of kind of um, getting the direction of the relationship wrong. So it could be that higher internet use leads to worse mental health, but it could also be that people with uh, worse mental health themselves kind of demand more um, social media and internet use. And so it is, in this case, it would be poor mental health itself that leads people to increase their online activities and not the other way around. So to overcome um, these challenges, economists have used the tools that we also apply to the study of other topics, which is First of all, we tried to find quasi experiments that introduce exogenous variation, and I'll be clearer about what I mean by this in a second, that introduce this exogenous variation in um, access to internet or access to social media. Or we have used the randomized control trial where we try to assign um, people in a random way to different groups. And in one group, for example, um, we ask treated participants to deactivate their social media. In the other group, we don't. And then after a while, we just compare the outcomes of these two groups. To give you 
A recent example from some work that I've carried out. Um, in a paper um, from 2022, I tried to leverage quasi-experimental variation um, in access to broadband internet to study whether broadband internet um, contributed in the recent widening of the gender gap in mental health. So with this paper, I started from the premise that mental health conditions have always been more prevalent on average among women than among men. But not only has the incidence of mental health conditions increased over time for everyone, but the gap in mental health conditions between men and women has also widened in recent years. So in this paper, I try to understand whether internet use can be a contributing factor to this widening gap. And to do so, I use a large panel data set from Germany that is called the German Socioeconomic Panel. This data set started before the year 2000, and essentially it's a huge data collection that um, where people were recruited in um, 1991 and then followed up over time um, until today. Most, uh, most people kind of dropped out at some point, but new um, respondents were added to the panel. But the important thing is that for every year since the beginning of the study, we have information on the background characteristics of the individuals that are participant to the ZERP, um, how their life has evolved, and the data also contains information on self-reported measures of current mental health that have been found to be good predictors of um, whether someone has received a mental health diagnosis or whether someone has been hospitalized for a mental health condition. Now, in the data, um, I also know more or less the exact location of where people live. So this would be something equivalent to knowing the postcode of people in the UK. And I use this information to combine the socioeconomic panel data with details on the characteristics of the German telecommunication infrastructure that was used to supply um, broadband internet. So in particular, in the very early phases of broadband internet development, the diffusion of broadband internet to households happened through the existing telephone lines that were used to connect people um, with the telephone. And the way telephone connection works is that households have to be connected to a so-called main distribution frame or MDF, which is essentially a termination point within the local exchange network that connects households to repeaters and other telephone equipment through copper wires. Now, the telephone infrastructure in Germany was um, designed in the 1960s. And as part of the design of the telephone infrastructure, it was decided where to place these main distribution frames. And the choice of location of these main distribution frames at the time, so in the 1960s, way before internet was a thing, mostly depended on factors that had to do with the availability of buildings or whether a location was appropriate to host a certain type of equipment. But this choice was not made in a way that minimized the distance between households and their assigned main distribution frame, because the distance or the length of the, uh, the wires that connected households to the main distribution frame was irrelevant for the quality of the telephone connection. However, when the same lines were then used to supply broadband internet, distance to the main distribution frame started to matter. And in fact, beyond a certain distance from uh, their assigned main distribution frame, the copper wires do not allow the supply of high-speed internet. So this means that for reasons that were completely independent of the future demand for broadband internet in the early years of its development, the lines, the copper lines were designed in ways that some people who lived close to a main distribution frame could, at the time of broadband internet development, get access to high-speed internet, and some people could not. So in this paper, I exploit this exogenous variation in access to broadband internet that is independent of internet demand to look at how internet affects mental health. And the way I do this in practice is I use where people live and the distance between people's households and the main distribution frame to predict 
whether or not they could get access to broadband internet in the early years of its development. So we're talking about the years between 2008 and 2012 in Germany. And then I use this predicted probability <clears throat> to look at how it affects mental health of adults in Germany. And what do I find? I find that broadband internet overall leads to a deterioration in the mental health of people and especially young women. So in this graph, I'm showing you coefficients that um, reflect the effect that having access to broadband internet has on mental health, which is measured with a composite index and standardized to have a mean of zero for the full sample. So the effect sizes are in standard deviation. And if we look at the three coefficients on the left, we find that for the full sample, there seems to be a deterioration in mental health that is driven by women, but the results are kind of insignificant for the overall sample of adults. When we break this down by age and look at whether the effects are different for the young population, namely those who are 35 years old or younger, and the old population, we find that the young population has been significantly affected and people who are 35 years or younger and have access to broadband internet score significantly lower on this self-reported index of mental health than people who do not have access to internet. And the effects are essentially almost entirely driven by young women. So it seems to be the case that internet contributed to widening the gender gap in mental health for the population of uh, young adults in Germany. And this is also the population that is more likely to be using the internet uh, for various activities compared to um, slightly older people. So in the paper, I also try to look at which, um, which aspects of mental health are particularly affected. And I find that um, internet leads to a deterioration in women's ability to cope with emotional problems. And it also leads to them feeling less productive and unable to complete um, their work tasks. I also look at kind of the mechanisms through which internet may be affecting mental health. And I find suggestive evidence that um, access to broadband internet reduces sleep time and also sleep quality. And sleep has been found to be positively linked to mental health. Now, the results from my paper are also similar with results from other studies that have looked at the same relationship between broadband internet and mental health in different contexts, for example, in the context of Italy and Spain, and here the focus is really on uh, hospitalization data. Uh, which kind of have um, less problems in terms of biases coming from self-reports. And these papers also found that uh, broadband internet increased the rates of hospitalizations be to, because of mental health conditions in Italy and Spain for the population of adolescents. But Internet use is a very broad, um, uh, very broad activity, and we actually do many things on the internet. So the question that emerges is, what is it about internet use that is so problematic and that that leads to a deterioration in mental health? And here, the fingers has been pointed kind of quite naturally to um, social media. And so um, in economics, we've started to look at um, questions that relate to the causal effect of consuming social media uh, and mental well-being. And here, there is very interesting work out there. Um, uh, some of it is from Luca Braghieri and his co-authors, but there are similar um, studies that use similar methodologies uh, also, um, where basically, in these studies, the authors exploit randomized control trials where essentially they recruit Facebook users and then they randomly assign a fraction of them to a treatment where people get paid to deactivate Facebook for a certain period of time. In the study by Luca Braghieri and co-author, this period of time was four weeks. And people who are not part of the treatment arm do not get paid and hence do not deactivate Facebook. Now the authors kind of track the Facebook activity of all the users that they recruit and um, they find that people assigned to the treatment arm, so people who got paid to deactivate people, to deactivate Facebook, actually deactivated it. 
So 90% of the treated participants really deactivated their, their Facebook profile. And then after four weeks, um, the authors look at the effect that this Facebook deactivation has had on a number of outcomes of interest, including um, mental health and subjective well-being. And they found that treated participants showed improvement in many dimensions of subjective well-being. So, for example, they showed higher life satisfaction, they showed um, less prevalence of depressive symptoms, and also of anxiety. And not only that, but after the end of the study, when um, treated participants could reactivate um, Facebook because the study was over, they found that they still were more likely to reduce their Facebook use at the end of the experiment, meaning that there was some kind of learning potentially where people realized that they might have been better off without Facebook or, or using less of Facebook, and they reduced their Facebook use afterwards. There is another study by um, also Luca Bragheri and co-authors where they looked at the same question, but using a slightly different methodology that again, exploits these variations in the possibility of accessing Facebook that are independent of people's demand for Facebook use. And in particular, they exploited the fact that when Facebook was developed, it was a social network meant for um, US colleges. And it started off in Harvard. And then between 2004 and 2006, it was rolled out um, across US colleges before being made available to the general public in 2006. So the authors exploit the staggered introduction of Facebook use across US colleges to look at the effect of Facebook use on mental health for the population of college students in the US. And they find that very similarly to the results from their other study, that Facebook leads to a deterioration in mental health and that um, people who got access to Facebook were also more likely to report that poor mental health was affecting their academic performance. When they look at which types of kind of interactions through Facebook may be causing this effect, they find good evidence that um, Facebook was increasing the probability that students were engaging in unfavorable social comparisons. And this seemed to have led to a decrease in their mental health. Um, finally, let me just spend the last few minutes of the talk to discuss the third reason why economic research on mental health is important. And this is because economists are often part of the discussion on how we can design better policies and what impact different policies that we have in place have on various outcomes of interest. And I think that in the context of mental health, economic research can contribute in two main ways. First, if we want to design mental health policies that make mental health services not only more equitable, but also more efficient in reaching those who are most in need, we need good data-driven evidence that economists are well-placed to provide. But also, we can include mental health as an additional outcome of interest when we assess the impacts, desired and undesired, of the policies that we implement as part of a more comprehensive assessment of how policy changes impact our daily lives. And here, I wanted to use the example of the recent COVID pandemic, which um, has caused a dramatic increase in the number of people suffering from mental health conditions. So the latest estimates um, suggest that um, uh, a 26 or 28% increase in um, uh, anxiety and depressive disorders in just one year uh, have been driven by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so the COVID-19 pandemic has caused significant disruptions to people's lives, which have come through these unprecedented policies that have been introduced to combat the spread of the virus. These were lockdown measures and school closures, which by all means have been very effective in preventing the spread of the virus. But a question that emerges is how have these policies affected mental health and are there gender differences or differences um, among different groups in the population in who um, suffered the, the, the largest effects? 
So in recent work that I carried out with Adam, with Abby and co-authors also from the University of Bonn and the University of Cambridge, we tried to answer this and other questions in what we called the COVID inequality project, where we essentially collected um, rapid response survey data at the very onset of the pandemic to understand how the pandemic was affecting labor market outcomes and health outcomes in the US, in the UK and in Germany. For questions related to the impact of the pandemic on mental health, we relied on the US SAM where we have data from three different survey waves that we ran in March, April, and May 2020, with a total of approximately 12,000 respondents. And we have good data on mental health, but also the individual characteristics of our participants, their employment, the characteristics of their job, and the way they spend their time. And we merged this data with information on the implementation of lockdown measures or stay at home orders in the US. And in particular, we have this information at the federal state level. And we exploit the fact that following the onset of the pandemic, uh, U.S. states kind of had autonomy in deciding which measures to implement and started to implement lockdown orders at very different points in time. So the first state to implement a lockdown order was California on March 19th of 2020, and then other states followed suit. Then in May 2020, when the pandemic situation started to ease a bit, some states started to roll back on these um, stay-at-home orders. And actually, there are states in the US that never implemented the stay-at-home order to begin with. So what we do in the study is we compare the mental health of people that at the time of our survey were living in a state that had introduced a lockdown measure to the mental health of people that at the time of our survey were living in places where they could still um, leave their homes. And what we find is that um, being in lockdown negatively affected <clears throat> the mental health of our adult representative sample of uh, people from the US. And the effect were mostly driven um, by women who were most severely affected. And this is consistent with other research from other countries that shows that women have been significantly more impacted by lockdowns than men. And these results also chime in with other evidence that shows that other types of policies that were implemented, for example, school closures, have negatively affected the subjective well-being of children. So this is to say that when we look at these policies, um, we can evaluate their overall effectiveness by also maybe taking into account other outcomes. And of course, we would find that these policies have been helpful in achieving um, the goal that they uh, were uh, designed to achieve, namely containing the spread of the virus. But this type of research is also important because it shows that these policies can have negative consequences on other domains. And we can use this, this evidence to kind of find ways of designing mechanisms that can promote um, mental health of the groups that are most at risk and um, mitigate some of these negative impacts. And let me just conclude by saying that the, there is a lot more that can be said about mental health and that there is a lot more that economists are working on at the moment. Some of the most exciting research avenues um, that I think um, we will see a lot more research coming from are um, uh, research around the determinants of demand for mental health. So we know that um, a lot of the people that suffer from a mental health conditions actually do not seek the help that they would need and they, they would benefit from. And so there is exciting work in this field, for example, uh, from um, three uh, PhD students that um, have, have been looked at why do people not seek help and what is the role of um, social stigma and perceptions about social stigma in hindering people, preventing people from seeking help. And also, I think one thing that we want, may want to know more is what is the effectiveness of different types of mental health treatments? So we have good evidence on, for example, cognitive behavioral therapy, but it would also be interesting in the future to study the effectiveness of other more light touch, if you want, um, uh, types of treatment like meditation and self-therapy. And I look forward to um, seeing the results of work that has been carried out, is being carried out now on this. 
And with this, I conclude by thanking you all for um, listening and I look forward to your questions. Hi, um, well, thank you so much, Marta. That was absolutely fantastic um, and really, really fascinating. Um, we have so many brilliant questions, <laughs> um, which I am going to try and summarize um, into kind of a couple of themes. So apologies for those of you who uh, uh, we, might, we might not get to through, through all of them. But um, so the first is um, there are a couple of questions um, kind of on your thoughts around why we see this gender gap in mental health outcomes, I guess, just in general between men and women, but also in terms of the relationship with social media and 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 um, and, and lockdown measures. And whilst, um, you know, you I think you've presented the evidence like really um, beautifully about these impacts, like can you, do you have any sense of where the kind of action might lie on mechanisms for the gender difference? Yeah. So um, on the first point on why do we see a higher prevalence of certain uh, mental health conditions in women? So this is um, kind of broad on average, but there is also difference in the type of condition that we're looking at. So for example, um, something like ADHD, ADHD, ADHD diagnoses are more common among boys, but it is true that anxiety and depression are um, more prevalent among women. It is not... Um, my reading is that it's not fully clear why this is the case, but in terms of what we've seen um, about the effect of social media use and mental health, one thing that has emerged is that um, girls and boys um, tend to use uh, social media a bit differently and internet a bit differently, and girls in particular are much more likely to kind of uh, use social media to compare themselves or like to look at um, other people's lives and reports of their lives. And because these reports are oftentimes biased, um, girls are much more likely to to have unfavorable uh, reference points for comparison that make them feel less satisfied with their own life. So this could also have something to do with the fact that girls, um, and this is kind of um, coming from another strand of research, but girls have less self-confidence than boys. So there would be these different mechanisms at play, a different type of use of social media, but also different um, levels of self-confidence to begin with that kind of um, combine in um, making it so that social media use has a worse impact on uh, mental health for girls than for boys. And actually, if we look at kind of the magnitude of this impact, this is quite sizable. So for example, um, when we look at um, results from the RCT that I just mentioned by Braghieri and co-authors, there they found that um, the effect of deactivating Facebook on mental health, the positive effect, is approximately equivalent to a fourth of the effect of going through a cycle of cognitive behavioral therapy. So it seems that, you know, there is really something going on with phase yeah. use that really matters for mental health. And with this, I want to pre preempt questions about, do we think that social media are completely bad for our mental, for our overall welfare? The answer is, no, we don't know. Uh, we would need to take into account many more dimensions of how social media affect our lives. Then there are also positive effects that have been shown, for example, on the level of information um, or on the ability of people to interact with more people, to coordinate for political movements, etc. So these are all examples of positive aspects of um, that social media use can bring to our life. Um, but I think more broadly, we can... Um, study a bit more the way in which people engage in uh, with social media and other users on social media to understand um, if there are ways in which we can maybe regulate or self-regulate some of our online interactions in ways that keep the positive benefits but also limit the negative consequences in terms of mental well-being. I think that's totally spot on and you've actually already kind of then hit off a kind of a bunch of different comments about asking about this kind of okay well, we've got potentially these negative mental health um kind of out 
um, impacts on mental health. However, there are all these other positive things that we get through the use of digital technologies, social like social media and the internet. And I think you are absolutely completely right in saying, well, a lot of this could just be about platform design. Like, how is it that we think about keeping the good aspects whilst minimizing the bad? And that's why kind of, you know, more of uh, research like yours um, is, is, is needed. So I think um, that's totally right. And um, one thing which has also come up a couple of times in the um, in the chat is um, is questions really about um, reporting, measurement, and and, and data. So um, you, you mentioned right at the end of your talk that there is kind of now more research being done on what causes people um, to um, actually seek mental health treatment and therefore I guess end up in some of your administrative uh, data sources um, but yeah I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about kind of changes if you like in the measurement of mental health outcomes and maybe how that affects um, how we think about empirical work in this area. Yeah, so um, this is really important because actually the measurement of mental health outcomes is uh, quite a difficult part of the empirical work that we do when we look at mental health as both an in input and an output in uh, the type of questions that we look at. Um, so there are two ways in which broadly we can measure mental health. One um, comes from self-reports and um, the other way comes from administrative data on health records where we have um, measures of, for example, hospitalization or prescriptions. Now, hospitalization um, data are obviously suffering way less from problems related to people not being willing to report that they're suffering from a certain conditions, because the moment you get hospitalized, this is kind of an objective measure. But they also capture the most severe uh, mental health um, disorders. So these are like very severe cases that end up um, uh, leading, that, that lead to hospitalization. For the less severe cases, which are the vast majority, we can rely on prescription data. But then, of course, this means that anyone who is not willing to seek help will not show up uh, in the data that we have, despite the fact that these data are um, quite objective. So um, I think the best evidence that we have on this relies on kind of comparing people who have uh, differential access to a certain type of treatment. Now, when we compare um, these, these groups of people around the time when this policy change happens, we can kind of exclude the fact that any effect that we find on mental health is driven by, for example, um, changes in stigma that happen around the same time or uh, changes in the probability of, of seeking treatment that happen around the same time. So this is the main challenge that the empirical work has been tried to tackle. And I think exploiting these kind of changes in policies um, uh, for access to treatment is one way of overcoming this issue. And now the other source of data is self-reports. And here, I think more and more um, self-reported measures of mental health are constructed in ways that um, indirectly ask participants about their mental health. So these measures come from survey questions that ask more generally about the frequency with which people have experienced the different feelings. And uh, these feelings have no direct um, or explicit connection to a certain type of mental health. And there is no negative connotation in the way in which the question is, is phrased um, that links a certain feeling with kind of a potentially negative judgment of the person that, that experiences it. So I think this is also one uh, way in which we can overcome some of the, the bias uh, that, that arises when having to talk about our mental health. No, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, and I think kind of the final question that we'll get through before we get to the end, there's um, a couple of questions really about how we might think about mental health as an input into economic outcomes and I guess you kind of started to talk a little bit about um, um, you know we have um, you know these effects of diagnoses of various kinds kind of depression bipolar disorder schizophrenia someone so someone has also asked a little bit about um, specifically around autism um, and so I guess there were two kinds of questions so one was um, uh, 
is are there like were you focusing more on like studies of out of, of mental health as an outcome in a sense because it's so difficult to think about in an empirical causal way about what the impact of good mental health outcomes are on these other issues um so i think that's probably one aspect and then um the, the other thing is i guess this interaction, do you know of anything around this kind of interaction of different forms of mental health with, for example, workplace programs or different policy programs, which could actually, you know, mediate some of these impacts of poor mental health on, on economic outcomes? Sorry, there's a lot there, but just kind of any of your kind of thoughts. <laughs> Um, so on the first point, I think, um, so again, this it, it is really challenging to kind of assess the impact of, of mental health on other outcomes, because oftentimes mental health and say um, labor market outcomes are determined by, to, a, to some extent, at least the same things. So if there is a negative event in my life, this is likely going to affect my mental health, but it also has repercussions on my uh, productivity, for example. So this is where I think the uh, economic toolbox can be really useful in trying to understand what the actual causal link between mental health and outcomes is. And the way we do this is different ways. But for example, the graph that I've shown about the um, earnings penalty in, in associated with mental health, there, the authors essentially were trying to compare very similar individuals um, that at some point in their life, some of them experienced the mental health diagnosis and some didn't. But these individuals are kind of similar on many observable characteristics or as many observable characteristics um, as we can observe. And then we can follow these people over time around the time of the diagnosis, where really the assumption is, okay, if, if trends are in the outcomes that we're interested in of these people before the diagnosis were similar, then we expect that in the absence of a diagnosis, their trends would follow the same pattern. And so any deviation um, between the two groups would give us the extent to which mental health is contributing to the outcome of interest. And then other studies have, have um, looked at kind of a first stage where we design interventions that are uh, able to improve mental health. So this is the second study that I presented, and it's part of a broader set of studies that has looked at um, uh, clinical trials that have tried to improve certain mental health conditions. So the first stage is, okay, there is um, a trial that uh, causally shifts mental health by um, improving it through some sort of treatment. And then we can use this um, exogenous, let's say, variation in mental health to look at how people with better mental health compare in terms of other outcomes to people who um, have not been treated and therefore um, whose mental health has kind of remained the same. And then I forgot the other question. <laughs> it was more, if, um, I guess, kind of thoughts on, um, this is too big a question in a sense, but I, it, there seems to be, there's just like so much, anyway, interest going on in the chat, which is great, kind of on um, workplace policies or kind of broader, broader government policies because you've meant that which kind of could mitigate these impacts and I guess one of the things you've just mentioned is actually effective access to um to to treatment and yeah. one of the things which we know at least in the UK is that that varies hugely across different geographies um yes. and it's how it's so there. here I think um something that we know we still need to more evidence on is exactly how easy it is for different groups of the population, uh, population living in different parts of a country to access good quality uh, mental health services. And the evidence that we have shows large heterogeneity in not only the supply of mental health services, but also um, the quality of these services. So I think one key question is going to be, okay, um, can we map the, the status of mental health services in a given country and can we identify areas or groups that are uh, particularly suffering in terms of lack of access to good quality care and target interventions to these groups that are the most at risk um, and here I think part of it is kind of supply so the the 
presence of uh, mental, uh, mental health care um, service center, but also the quality of, of the service and the diversity in um, the staff that um, works at the, the mental health service center. So for example, there is some research in the US that shows that um, ethnic minorities are less likely to seek treatment because they feel that they would not be trusted um, in their reports of how they feel by mental health staff. So I think there is a lot that we need to do to understand where, if there are these biases in the way people interpret reports coming from uh, different sets of individuals and how we can address potentially unconscious and conscious biases um, to improve the quality of the services that we offer. Wow, that's fantastic, Marta. And actually, I just use this opportunity to tag that. So next year, we're going to be continuing with these What Economists Really Do um, uh, kind of talks. And the first one will be um, kind of some of the broader economics around kind of disability and disability discrimination. Um, and one of our faculty, well, actually our head of department has done some work on kind of gender differences in how certain types of kind of disability reports um, get, get, get treated. Um, that was completely fantastic thank you so so much um we're already over time so i'm really sorry to any everyone um who um who specific questions uh, we didn't get to i hope i was able to kind of summarize most of them into into those broader themes um we'll be sending uh, that this talk will be um post, posted on youtube um and uh, we'll also put um, a couple of links to the papers that marta mentions in her slides um on the page um but that just leaves me again to say a massive massive thank you um to marta and to all of you for your brilliant questions um, and hopefully we'll see you all um at the next installment okay and thank you so much for coming <laughs> cool bye bye